Uh, and our first speaker today is from Houston Methodist. Uh, Dr. Jason Alexander did his uh, training at uh, Columbia as a resident and did his fellowship at uh, Texas Heart. Also did a critical care fellowship uh, at Columbia, yes. Uh, and now uh, he's gonna present uh, heart transplantation. All righty, let's see. Okay, so uh, the timer already started. Um, 15 minutes to teach everything I know about heart transplant, right? This is gonna basically be very, very um, general in terms of our concepts. This is what I'd like to cover. I don't know if we're gonna get to all of it. It's the overall basic summary. So when you're coming up with uh, a lecture on how to talk about heart transplants, um, over 15 minutes, I tried to come up with a goal. And what I realized was I can't go over things that you can Google search. So if you want to learn about criteria, exclusion criteria, um, how we list people, you go to Google and you just put in this article, it will come up. So today's talk is only meant to inform you of things that I think the books aren't going to teach you. Okay, there's nuances and pitfalls to, to heart transplantation. The way that most of us learned is early on in our career, we made a few mistakes and learned from those mistakes. I'm going to try to get you to uh, a point where you won't be making those kinds of mistakes that most new attendings kind of hit. So preoperatively, you guys already know this, a uh, majority of uh, heart transplants are going to be dilated cardiomyopathy. It's multiple etiolo etiologies. The real takeaway from this slide is that second bullet point. These people have a fixed low stroke volume. They are heart rate dependent, preload dependent. They don't have contractility, right? So they can't generate more cardiac output by squeezing harder, so it's preload and heart rate that's gonna be the important thing. The second thing is a compensatory increase in your SVR. So that's the takeaway. Three things to maintain in your heart transplants. Preload, heart rate, and SVR. If you mess with any one of those, your patient can do poorly. The echo findings are gonna be pretty consistent with everything you've seen in residency. The important things that I look out for is severe TR, that's long standing, because that's gonna to lead to hepatic dysfunction, and RV failure, because that makes the entire transplant a little more tricky. Your appearance of your patients are gonna vary. I've had people who are totally healthy appearing just here for refractory angina, whose echoes are essentially normal to the combined heart-liver transplant patients who look like they're gonna die at any moment. Some are gonna have pre-existing VADs as bridge to transplant. Others are gonna be you know, just coming in from home and others are gonna be in the CCU for anywhere from one to two weeks on inotropes intubated possibly. So what are we gonna look out for in these transplants? Obviously, you're gonna do everything they taught you in residency, right, in terms of a pre-op, specifically to cardiac. These are the things that I think you have to really focus on. So you gotta look at their previous echo and what we're looking for, specifically, in addition to everything, is RV function, PA pressures, and severe TR, and we kind of alluded to why those things are important, okay? On the chest X-ray, I like to see if they have uh, huge pleural effusions, that's gonna that's gonna play a role when it's time to induce this patient, right? Your FRC is gonna be reduced severely. They may not be able to lay flat. Obviously, you wanna look at inotropes, vasopressors. Most of these patients are on some form of anticoagulation, so it's up to you to find out how much they're on, what their coagulation studies are, when they stopped it, and then have a discussion with your surgeon as to what's the plan in terms of reversing or seeing if you could do it without reversing. Uh, take a look at the LVAD parameters so you have a baseline. A few more things that you're gonna to have to investigate and coordinate. So allergies are important, especially HIP. If your patient is HIP positive, you immediately call your hematologist, pathologist, surgeon, come up with a game plan as to what you're gonna do. That varies by institution. Um, NPO status, a lot of times these guys are coming in from home, they may have just eaten. You have to take that into, into account before you start getting ready for your induction. You wanna look at previous anesthetics. Was he a difficult airway in the past? Um, I like to know stroke risks, TIA risks, because that's something that comes up, comes up, uh, appears in cardiac surgery um, more frequently than other types of surgery. Dysphagia and GI bleeding is the big one that fellows initially forget to ask because it's not the common ones you ask, right? You're gonna be placing an echo probe in someone. You need to know if they have dysphagia. GI bleeding is really important. We know LVAD patients have a higher uh, risk of GI bleeding. We know most of these people are gonna be on anticoagulation for AFib or um, previous clots in the, in the heart as well. So if somebody's telling you that they're having GI bleeding, that's gonna contribute to your conversation of, hey, should we reverse this guy to a somewhat normal INR before you start putting in an echo probe into the patient? 
immunosuppression and antibiotics is going to be per uh, institution. You should talk to the transplant um, team regarding that. So a couple of pitfalls that I've seen and I've personally experienced. Pre-medication, we kind of take for granted, right? Two of uh, Versed and 50 of fentanyl, right? Almost everyone can tolerate that, but you're going to see a subset of patients who will not tolerate this. And this is going to be your sickest of your sick patients, right? So the ones who can't do any normal daily living, right? So you're class four heart failure, essentially. So these guys are kind of surviving on stress catechols. When you take away any kind of sympathetic tone, they don't tolerate it. A lot of them have pre-existing RV failure or pulmonary hypertension. That's a deadly combo to give someone fentanyl and Versed and cause hypoventilation, right? The hypercarbia is really going to play a role in how this patient does. Most of the time when we give these pre-medications, it, it tends to be in, a, in an interim of less monitoring. So we're moving from pre-op to the OR, or we got into the OR, and now we're moving to the bed, and the patient's anxious, so we give it. It's a, it's a risky time to not be monitoring the patient, so at least you have to pay very close attention to how the patient is um, appearing. My personal pet peeve is the second one. Do not exert your patient right before you're about to give him an anesthetic, okay? You're going to hear this a lot where they say, do you think you can move over? The guy can't brush his teeth without getting short of breath. <laughs> Okay, but do you think the patient's going to say that? No, they're always going to try. Okay, so I had the unfortunate event of a patient going into um, RVR while we were moving over. Obviously, none of your monitors are really hooked up because we're moving. We had to shock them emergently. It was a mess. Okay, so my general rule of practice is we should be moving these patients. They should do absolutely nothing before you're about to give them an anesthetic. Along with that is what we see, you know, first-time resident or fellows come in. When you move them over, they drop the bed completely flat. A lot of these patients can't tolerate that move, especially if their RVs are tenuous, okay? They can't take the, uh, the volume shifts. So be careful, and that's why you're gonna look on your echo and your chest x-ray for pleural effusions and more importantly, pericardial effusions. We had that um, a few days ago, and it played a role in how the patient did in terms of an induction. This stuff we're gonna basically uh, skip over. You guys know you're gonna need the monitors that you need, right? We don't have to really go into this. Please do not stop inotropes or vasopressors that were started in the CCU. People do this mainly for one reason, they don't want to transport the pump, and so they just start shutting things off. I don't understand why, but I've seen this multiple times. If the CCU took, you know, three days to get that ready, you probably don't want to be shutting that off right before you're going to stress the patient. So take a look at this. This is an, um, a record of uh, induction, right? This is just a typical thing that we see now. I don't know how many of you guys induce cardiac patients with propofol. Anyone? Raise your hands. Yeah, it looks like the, only, it's like the Methodist people. <laughs> We induce with propofol. It can be done. We do it routinely. The key is knowing how to, how to use that drug, and the same goes for anything, right? So the important thing to look at is your pre-medication, your propofol, all of your drugs that work are going to have a much longer circulation time. And what happens is people aren't patient enough. So you see here where we kind of start off. Let me see if I have a, uh, yeah. So you look over here. The patient's blood pressure is pretty stable, right? We induced way back here, all righty? It's after the fact that we start to see this dip. And this next slide, just to give you an idea of the actual numbers, this is pretty good, you know? I think everyone's happy with this point. Patient's getting sleepy, getting sleepy, still not out. But eventually you get there, right? And then what happens? All of this hits the patient at once, okay? And this is where you see these big drops in your pressures, your preload. Fortunately, a lot of times what happens is they Brady down because they become ischemic. And then what do you have to do here? CPR. Okay? Do not wait to do CPR. That's the next thing. If your patient's pressures aren't good, no medication you give is going to make it. So you got to do CPR early to get that epi or whatever you're given into the patient. And then almost always they'll respond in a dramatic fashion there. Okay? <laughs> These are just things that happen when you first start out. So here's kind of what we kind of said. Circulation time is uh, slower than normal. When in doubt, call for help. Call your surgeon early rather than late. Special note with LVAT patients. People get complacent, I think, when they're inducing LVAT patients. You know, Why? Because they feel like, hey, I'm protected, right? So take a look at this. The important thing to look at this is look at the maps. These maps are pretty acceptable, right? But what happened is we pre-medicated, we induced with a small bit of propofol, and the maps are maintained. Now, you see the pulsatility, how it starts out pretty good, gets less, 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 zero pulsatility. If you're only looking at maps, you're not worried. In my head, 
your PI, right, on the LVAD, let's say, HeartMate 2. It's telling you how much is your native heart contributing to overall forward flow, right? So right here, you're doing pretty good, which means there is some contribution, okay? You could see it starts to drop and drop and drop. And my concern when people just kind of sit on this because the maps are normal is you have an LVAD. You don't have BIVADs, right? So you're leaving the RV high and dry, okay? So if you do something that annoys the LV, most likely, especially if there's RV dysfunction, you're going to annoy the RV, okay? And that's the point people don't realize with an LVAD. So what ends up happening, you get kind of flat. You still maintain a map, but then it starts to drop off. And what you're having is acute RV failure with an LVAD that then leads to no forward flow. You get no preload into your LVAD. You start to chatter, and then you get a suction event, okay? So you got to... It's hard to just say, well, do you give an ionotrop or volume? But the point is, if you can start early to keep the perfusion pressures up in this point, you don't typically get over here, okay? Just don't get complacent with those LVATs. Really quick, we're going to skip a lot and kind of just touch on weaning um, bypass. So this is like, uh, how do you wean bypass, right, on a heart transplant? That's like asking Michelangelo, how do I paint the Sistine Chapel? And you get 15 minutes to tell me, okay? <laughs> So there's a few things you got to make sure of. So you want to make sure you de the heart, obviously, right? Most of us, every institution I've been at, tends to rest the heart to give it time to recover, um, to wash out the toxins and things like that. We aim for higher perfusion pressures in these patients. So routinely, maps of 80s are acceptable. Chronotropy is key, so you're most likely going to start something, whether it's pacing or pharmacologic agents, to try to get the heart rate of at least 100. Most people say 110. And an ionotrope's often necessary. Um, I think the key is starting it early rather than later. If you crash back on pump, the heart doesn't recover as well, okay? So you're gonna use TEE to directly observe and diagnose things. The moral of the story, the thing you're gonna hear is RV, 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 RV. That's it. The RV is what's gonna usually fail. That's what's leading to most of the um, deaths in the early uh, phases after heart transplant. You've got to be very, very cautious about giving volume to an RV that's either sluggish or struggling. You've got to be careful. That's all I'm going to say because you've seen people come off pumps. Even with normal cabs, we come off 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, okay, give some volume, give some volume. That's not how these go. Volume can literally kill your patient, okay? So you'll probably have to use some pressors to kind of bridge the gap while you're trying to give volume and slow. All righty? Start ionotropes and vasopressors early if you see that the RV doesn't look that good while you're on full flow. Inhaled pulmonary vasodilators are pretty mainstay. Um, you're reducing RV afterload. You could use nitric oxide or a prostacycline like Flolan. Um, they have similar outcomes. There's no real difference uh, in either of those. It's just, again, institution dependent. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes it's not going to help, right? The RV is just not going to be good enough, and we had this three days ago. And you're going to have to do some kind of support, whether your institution believes in um, RVADs or ECMO. It's possible that you're going to end up on a device. So the last slide, really quick, is about um, just touching on post-pump bleeding because um, it's a tough decision to make at that time. So what typically happens is you give the protamine, you know, obviously watch out for the RV. There's not much bleeding surgically, but you're still oozing, right? So then you send off all your labs, and then they come back. All the labs are normal, right, or close to normal. But clinically, the patient is bleeding. So you can't rest on these normal labs, and that's the big mistake I see people do. They see an INR 1.6 and a fibrinogen's 200, and the platelets are like 105, and they say, well, I'm good. Everything's fine. But what you're not taking into account is for the last 20 minutes while it took the lab to run those numbers, there's been oozing. There's been ongoing bleeding. There's been ongoing consumption. Okay, so you got to keep looking over the field. You got to make sure you're not still bleeding. You got to look and see is there clot formation? Okay, most of the time in these situations, if you get caught behind, it's hard to recover. Why? Because it can't slam in two FFP, two platelets, you know, 20 of cryo in an RV that could be struggling. Okay, so what I tend to do is I care more about um, what's going on on the field. And most of the time, you can tell pretty easily that, hey, there's no clot. Like, when they pull out that suction yank hour, it's like water coming off of that. And I transfuse fairly early so that you can kind of maintain a normal CVP and not overshoot. Um, again, a lot of this is institution dependent. It's going to depend on kind of what your institution does. 
The key is communication is important, and again, RV, RV, RV. That's the main thing. Any questions? I got 21 seconds. <laughs> Hit me.